Okay, what do we know about the order? Well, we'll have a look. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Thank you. Is everybody still alive? Yes. I often wonder what it's like to come to one of my meetings. <laughs> I just can't imagine sitting there listening to all this. Okay, let's, let's read it together, shall we? Chapter 322, it's called that, is a secret society whose members are sworn to silence. Above all, the order is powerful, unbelievably powerful. The order meets annually, patriarchs only, on Deer Island in the St. Lawrence River. When a new member is initiated into the order, they say tonight he will die to the world and be born again into the order as he will have a new name and 14 new blood brothers also with new names. And if you see the film called The Skulls, you'll see on the wall of the, uh, of the order, the lodge called The Order or The Skull and Bones, it's got the word war, W-A-R, and that's why George Bush is always having wars. He's got to send his people off to Afghanistan, and then he says, he speaks about the, tri the axis of evil. He's talking about uh, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. You see, he's always got to be ready to send the troops somewhere else. This is the policy of the lodge. Also, on the wall of the lodge is a, a swastika, a German swastika, for it is a German secret society. Very evil indeed dedicated to world government, and the president of America still belongs to that society because you can never get out unless you're killed or unless you die. Next one, please. Watch this one. The order has either set up or penetrated just about every significant research, policy, and opinion-making organization in the United States, in addition to the church, business, uh, government, and politics. The evolution of America reflecting individual opinion, ideas, and decisions at the grassroots is simply not true. On the contrary, says Anthony Sutton, the writer of this book, the broad direction has been created artificially and stimulated by the order. He's a brilliant writer, this guy. Next, please. <coughs> well, I think we've done that one. It's all right, though. Here it is. Now, what's this one? The order follows the philosophies of George Hegel, a German philosopher. All historical events emerge from a conflict between opposing forces. Excuse me, everybody. You must have a conflict before we get the new world order. That's why everywhere there's a change, they have a conflict. E.g., South Africa. Now, he divides the world. This the philosopher called Hegel, he says part of the world is thesis, the other half is antithesis, and when you bring them together, that is called synthesis. Let's look at South Africa, shall we? Thesis, Nelson Mandela, ANC. Antithesis, Butelezi, the Zulus. There is no chance of peace between the two groups. Henry Kissinger goes over there. The next thing, he brings them together, and they have a, the, the rainbow nation, the new South Africa. It happens. That is called synthesis. <coughs> Illustration, you go to Ireland. You've got the union in the north with Ian Paisley. You have Jerry Adams and the IRA. There's no chance of peace there. Henry Kissinger goes over there with a group, and before you can say Jack Robinson, there is some sort of peace in uh, Ireland. Uh, what else? America and Russia. America, thesis. Russia, antithesis. At a certain time in history, they come together and they now have a headquarters running space program together. It used to be, you uh, hate each other, they said. The axis of evil, they said. The evil nation, satanic and so on. Next thing you see, you see uh, Ronald Reagan next to Gorbachev. And now it's Ronnie and Gorby. <coughs> They've got their arms around each other. And they're having a photo taken. That's called synthesis. There's only one more big one they want to do. That's Israel, thesis, Arabs, antithesis. And at the right time, using the Hegelian dialectical philosophy, they will bring those two groups together in a seven-year treaty, fulfill the Bible prophecy, and Jesus will come again. Okay. Woohoo! Okay, now they say, well, if that's the case, the question is asked by Hegel, if it is true that they organize all the governments around the world, even your government in Canberra is run by the order. If that's the case, what is the use of having so many people in parliament? And here's the answer here. This is what Hegel says. The function of a government or congress is to give the impression the peasants have some value. <laughs> so when they pass a law, it makes them feel good. And they allow them to feel like that, but they control the ultimate destiny of every country on earth. All right. <coughs> now, someone said to me in America, can you prove George Bush belongs to that group? Yes. You say, how can you prove it? It's in our newspaper in New Zealand. Have a look at this. <coughs> this is taken from the New Zealand Herald on the 26th of April, 2001. Skullduggery uncovers Bush's bony secrets. The bizarre rituals of one of America's most exclusive clubs 
which counts President Bush and his father among its members, has been laid bare by a hidden camera. The, someone put a camera up on the roof of the Skull and Bones Club. The all-male Skull and Bones Club at Yale University has long been held up as an example of the powerful cabals that run America from behind the scenes. Soon after he entered the White House, George W. Bush <coughs> held a private dinner for his year of bonesmen, as they are called. It is the initiation ceremony of this year's members caught by fellow Yale students on a night vision camera that has set things astir. Over here, please. During the initiation, new members undergo a mock throat-cutting ceremony. They then take turns to lie in a coffin and recount their personal and sexual histories to forge a bond of secrecy within the club. Having died as barbarians, they step from the coffin, reborn as members of the order. Members remain in the club for life. And that's why poor George is called temporary. He's in a very sticky position at the moment. No wonder he looks a bit nervous when he comes on television. Okay. We now move quickly on. Now, the building of the world government, thank you, is likened to the building of a house. I think you'll enjoy this bit. When you build a house, do we have any builders here tonight, please? Don't be a shy, brother. That's all right. Yeah, God bless you. <laughs> We're not against you. <laughs> Anybody who builds a house will know you start with a foundation. Who agrees with that? You don't even have to be a builder to know that. Where's the foundation? Please, we've lost it. Here it is. Now, the foundation of the World Government House was the Illuminati, 1776. We all know that now. We've done that. The next thing you do is you build a framework, and they chose New Zealand as the framework. I'll explain how it happened. Now, I know that <clears throat> in many cases... People over here think New Zealand is a very small country. Geographically, it's the same size as Great Britain. The only difference is it has less people. And it's very quiet. When I go to England, I'll be there next month, God willing. I've got a month in England again. And when I go twice this year, we go twice this year to England. When you go to Heathrow Airport, you can hardly get there. There's so many cars. And when you get back to New Zealand, you might get off the plane at Christchurch, drive home 200 miles, and I might pass two motor cars. And if I do, I say to my wife, my word is busy tonight. <laughs> How many people have we got? Three and a half million. How many have they got in England? 160 million, isn't it? A country the same size as New Zealand. And they chose it for a test case, and this is how it happened. Let me draw it for you. Here it is. There's New Zealand. North Island, South Island, Stewart Island. Here's your country here. Always put Tasmania in, they get excited. <laughs> <coughs> Over here, put in the date line, you see? Now, why did they choose New Zealand as a test case for the world government? The reason is that we are close to the date line and we start the computers every day. So when the sun hits Mount Hikarangi, uh, the computers roll in New Zealand, then they roll around Eastern Standard Time, Central Standard Time, Western Standard Time over there and around the world. My wife comes from an island called Samoa. I will draw a map of that for you. There. <laughs> now, watch this. Watch this, everybody. If you have Christmas dinner here, you have Christmas dinner there the next day. So you have two Christmas dinners. It's all right. It's, it's a bit difficult if you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure whether that's the right one or that one. <laughs> In fact, it is so confusing. Listen, everybody, I'm not being rude. It's so confusing to the Seventh-day people that when you go to Tonga, they have their seventh day on Sunday. And I went there. We've been to Tonga a few times. I went down to their church. I said, why are you worshipping on Sunday? Your Seventh-day Adventist. They said, somebody fiddle with the international date line. <laughs> Honestly, Interesting. Anyway, the point is this, that because we are next to the date line here, we start the money system, we are important to the world government people. Secondly, we are a small nation that are very easy to manipulate. The motto of New Zealand is, she'll be right. And the Australian motto, she'll be right, mate. <laughs> That's why they do anything to us at all. We are very relaxed sort of people. There's no, not much excitement in our country. We're not excitable people. Over in America years ago, they had a program on television. Do you remember it? That's incredible. You'd have a fellow like Evil Knievel riding his motorbike over the Grand Canyon. And all the Americans jump up and shout, that's incredible. 
New Zealand tried to make one.